Welcome, welcome. I don't know if you can hear, but I have my window cracked in my office and the birds are outside singing. It really sounds like uh, springtime. I'm going to wait till after I introduce myself to open my window because like last week, as soon as I go to open my mouth, a car will honk and then I'll forget everything that I wanted to say. <laughs> We've all been there. Yes. But after I introduce myself, I'm opening this window. <laughs> I also had a quick little poll I wanted to launch. Um, pretty painless, but I wanted to get to know you guys a little bit more. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that up here. Go ahead and take that at your leisure. Just so you know, there are multiple questions and you have to answer them all before you hit submit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. I learned that one the hard way. <laughs> Welcome, Jen. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good to see everybody. We'll get started here right at 630. I know as we get going to some more people drop in, but I'm gonna go ahead and start off with a quick introduction um, and some quick introductions. Thank you everybody again for joining us tonight. Um, my name's Cassandra Clevenger and I work with Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership. My official job title there is Community Resource Coordinator, but I wear a lot of hats. Um, and I guess, so to speak, I'm putting a little link in the chat. The biggest hat I wear um, at Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership um, is my work around food, food security, farming, food access. Um, we also manage the Warren Farmers Market at Perkins Park. So just a quick little shout out to that project. If you're interested in becoming a vendor, our market manager will actually be on this call here a little bit later. They're attending this workshop too, so they can definitely give you more information afterwards, but please reach out if you're interested in doing that. We welcome small scale fruit and vegetable producers to our market, meats, honey, um, cottage foods, if you're baking at home, all of those awesome things. So please reach out to us. And um, I do a lot of work with community gardens and, and urban agriculture and, and small scale sustainability farming. So that's part of what kind of inspired some of these series. Um, I guess Lee and I were kind of reflecting here over um, the past, we started this um, work in this area of the country. Lee's been doing this work in general much longer than myself, but we started in um, Trumbull County here around the same time about five years ago now. So just working to present more opportunities for farmers, for growers, people that want to um, do more agriculture related activities. Trumbull County is an agricultural county and we have lots and lots of land available for growing. So um, 
yeah, we just try to help connect folks to the opportunities and the resources to be able to do all of that. So I will go ahead and stop talking now since you guys caught my little introduction and I see more people are joining us. That's so, so awesome. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Lee. All right, thank you, Cassandra. Um, so for those of you who were not with us last week, my name is Lee Beers. I'm the Extension Educator for Agriculture and Natural Resources in Trumbull County. Um, I wanna thank Cassandra for putting together this program and writing uh, the grant um, to make this, this happen. Uh, tonight, I have the uh, pleasure to introduce Jacqueline Kowalski. She's my counterpart in Summit County. So she's the Extension Educator in Summit County. Um, and she's gonna be talking about season extension um, on both ends, spring and fall. Um, and I, I wanna make a plug here. She is not one of those educators that will go out and talk about how you do things without actual practical knowledge. Jacqueline is, is walking the talk, right? So she actually sells at farmer's markets. Uh, I believe cut flowers. I don't, I don't remember if you do any vegetables, um, but she, she knows her stuff. Well, with that, I will let you take it from there. And I am going to close the poll if that's okay with you, Cassandra. Go ahead, yes. All right, take it away, Jacqueline, thanks. Thank you, Lee. I'm excited to be here tonight, um, and thank you for joining us. I know that the weather is very beautiful, and um, it's a good night to be outside, but as we're going into the next growing season, season extension might be something that you're considering um, incorporating into your operation. As Lee had mentioned, I, um, I currently work in Summit County, but the places that I've lived, I have um, tried to manage season uh, Seasonal extension in different ways. I grew up in Northern Michigan and basically we, if uh, in normal circumstances, we'd plant about June 1st and about the second week of September, we would pretty much have uh, be finished with field operations because we've experienced a frost or freeze or both or snow or whatever calamity. And most of my career I spent in the Virgin Islands, which you think, oh, well, that's always a hot, warm environment. Things must grow all the time for every reason. And in some, times of the year, yes, but seasonality as far as different types of pest disease and water management were also concerns when it came to season extension. So I do have to say I'm having issues with my computer um, forwarding my slides. Um, so I'm sorry if there's a little bit of lag time. So when we're talking about season extension, why are we considering season extension? So, you know, when I was a younger person earlier in my career, this, or earlier in my life, this wasn't as much talked about, but what you're seeing now on more of a larger scale are operators who are able to utilize techniques to lengthen their growing period. So season extension, usually we can get longer production. So in Northeast Ohio, uh, we can in some years get close to 11 months of production in some years, we get nine months of production using season extension. It really just comes down to whether if we're using passively heated uh, techniques. We can get earlier and larger crop productions. So many folks who are using season extension techniques, whether they be simple row covers or utilizing high tunnels, can get their products on the market much earlier than uh, traditionally is known. And why is that important? Um, because usually you can demand a lot, much larger price the earlier you can get a um, acceptable crop on the market. Think about the folks who have the first tomatoes at the farmer's market. You know folks are buying those tomatoes up like crazy. Because of um, some of the season extension techniques, particularly in covered production, you can have potentially higher yields if all other factors are um, working in your favor, meaning you can have uh, production that is happening sooner, is happening longer, and you may have disease and pest issues. Leading into potential profits. So if you have more produce and you have a market for that produce, you'll potentially have higher profits for that year. Cleaner produce, so one thing that does happen under field operations is we do have 
times where our produce can get a little dusty, a little muddy, what have you. And it, under season extension techniques, sometimes that um, you can mitigate that by using things like black plastic mulch. If you have indoor or um, covered production like high tunnels, you just have less splashing. Many times you may have less disease issues. And I say that, or I should say possibly, you have less disease and I would add even pests in there as well. But again, it all comes down to management. You know, when you're utilizing season extension, you're utilizing, you're manipulating the microenvironment. So you're either raising the temperature, you might be capturing humidity. So the more you learn about how to manage that microenvironment, the more you'll be able to manage those pest and disease issues as they come out. It is possible that you'll have fewer weeds. So for example, if you're using mulches, which are basically an industry standard for larger scale production and small scale production, um, you'll use techniques that will hopefully um, lead to less weed issues and better water management in times. Again, if you have, um, if you have protected culture or you're covering things, it's up to you to manage the water and better water management leads to usually not always, less um, disease pressure. It can lead to lower cost if you're paying for that water. So we're gonna talk about basically the, the least expensive and the um, site specific sort of season extension down in cost and effort all the way to high tunnels. And I know that there's um, a wide range of producers or producers who are thinking about becoming um, scaling up or people who are just thinking about growing, but this might give you some options of things you can try out um, as your operation grows and you have different or expanded markets. So cultural practices are basically the easiest thing that we're talking about. So we're talking about the things that really don't cost a ton of money, but really knowing more about your space that you're growing at. So first of all, site selection. So as Lee had mentioned, I um, farm on two sites. Um, I didn't have a lot of selection, either one of those, except for the fact that they were available to me. One is much closer to the lake. I live in, uh, I live in Lakewood, Ohio, which is... Um, very close to Lake Erie, and one is a little further inland. And one thing that I've noticed, there's a dramatic difference between the two sites when it comes to wind, temperature, and uh, frost issues. So my area that's nearer to the lake, I tend, it tends to be warmer, it tends to dry out a lot faster, and I tend to be able to start growing there much easier or much earlier. Whereas my site that's a little bit further inland is a site that I'm able to um, start working a couple weeks later. So therefore I have an, a natural succession plan. So if I start spinach in one spot in you know, one week, I can, I can start spinach at that same time on the other site, but I know it won't be ready for a couple more weeks. So by utilizing your site selection, going from the places that warm up faster to the places that remain a little bit cooler, you can use that to your advantage to select varieties and place plants in, in ways that they'll either grow faster or a little slower, depending on what your needs are. A little bit about soil and soil moisture. Um, darker soils tend to heat up a little faster in the spring and will store more heat than uh, lighter colored soils, meaning that um, that soil temperature will be a little warmer earlier. So if you have seeds that are your direct seeding, it's that are um, your cool season crops, they will germinate a little bit faster than say if you're just planting those in lighter colored soils. And similarly with wet soils, they will hold heat um, more so than dry soils. Worked up soils tends to um, lose heat a little faster and the more moist soils can, will be like, can be up to 5% warmer um, on uh, any given day than drier soils. So you can use that to your advantage when working with the site that you have available to you. And again, you'll learn that over time, you may not notice those small differences in your first couple of years. But again, once you realize those, you can use those differences to your advantage. Now, this is something I, you, I saw more so in the um, 
southern part of the U.S. when it comes to citrus production, and that this may be done in some of the grape orchards up this way. But if you are growing outside and you do have the um, potential of frost or freezes, you can use spray irrigation to protect your crop, crops during that time. But it's important to know that if you don't do it right, you can um, you can lose your crop one, you may, if you put on too little water, it's not going to release enough heat to protect the plant tissue. And if you put on too much water, you hit waterlogged soils, which cause root issues. Um, but this is something that I've seen over the course of my career. But again, I don't see it very often uh, up this way with vegetable growers. Cultivar selection. So if you were to go to a seed catalog, particularly those that are geared toward um, mid to smaller acreage farmers, you're gonna notice a lot of um, cultivars that are available to you that'll give you some flexibility in what you plant when. So um, for example, spinach. Spinach is a um, plant that has this huge range of, of um, tolerances to, to heat and light, et cetera, and, and downy mildew and things of that nature. So you can actually, throughout the course of the season, select cultivars that are gonna be more suited to cooler season production, to warmer season production. If you have particular situations where you have um, disease issues, there may be ones that are gonna be more tolerant to those disease issues. But by choosing your cultivars carefully, you can also extend your season. Now transplants, um, most of us know trans, you know, of course, no transplants, eggplant transplants, peppers, things of that nature, because we know that our growing season in Ohio generally isn't going to lend itself to a direct seeding and getting type of a production that we want. But when I moved to Ohio, I was very interested to learn, and I learned I moved to Ohio about 10 years ago, that a lot of producers who were utilizing high tunnels and other sorts of um, season extension techniques were instead germinating their crops and growing seedlings of crops that I just would have never thought, you know, when I was a 30 years ago undergraduate that you would that you would grow from transplant, for example, beets, things like lettuce, things like spinach. Whereas if you do grow those transplants and then transplant them into your high tunnel or under low tunnels or into your um, cold frames, you'll get a good jump on your season. There's a little bit of a caveat for that. Some of that is weather dependent. So if you are transplanting transplants, your, your plants is partially grown for sure, but there's gonna be some time that it takes for that root system to actually acclimate into whatever, wherever you're planting it. And if, that, if the weather is not conducive or if you have these really, really long cold snaps, there's gonna be a little bit of delay. So three to four weeks on a good year. Um, however, if the year is unusual or you have some weather events, that may be very, um, it may be less than three to four weeks. It could be two weeks. And I've actually had the um, situation myself, not with vegetable crops, but with flower crops where I've planted plug plants that were, you know, five to eight weeks old and direct seeded. And I actually did get production at about the same time. But generally transplanted seedlings will give you a little bit of a jump on the seed on production. Some of your cultural practices using multiple cropping systems. So utilizing your spring crops that are cool season crops, such as spinach or lettuce, then using that same space for a warmer season crop, and then going into a fall crop that's well suited for those cooler temperatures. So if you were growing, say, spinach, um, you could have planted it last fall. You could have planted it recently. You could have recently planted transplants. And you should be able to get a crop here, um, a couple couple cuttings by mid mid um, May, maybe much earlier than that. Again, depending on how warm it is, and then you'd be able to immediately remove that, um, turn it over with the proper uh, soil amendments and uh, soil preparation into a warm season crop such as squash, 
and that may be a short season summer squash and then in late summer turn that over into a fall crop so basically you're using that seam space from about february all the way through october or even longer than that again depending on the weather Use of mulch is industry standard, is standard for small scale growers too. And there's a lot of different types of mulch available. Um, if you are an organic grower, you will want to talk to your certifier to, um, to ensure whatever you do plan on using for mulch is gonna fit into your certification program. So one of the advantages to, to black plastic mulch, um, actually there's two advantages. One, it suppresses weed growth dramatically. Um, which is a bane to small vegetable and fruit growers because we spend a lot of time managing weeds if, we, if we're not using herbicides or um, things of that nature. And also it warms up the soil temperature. So usually you can get 10 and even higher um, temperatures under black plastic than you would for soil that's not covered. But in order for, those, for that advantage to occur, you do have to have good soil contact when you're putting down the mulch. Now, um, of course, for larger scale production, which is shown here, um, there, are, there are equipment and implements that you utilize for that. There have been a lot more smaller scale implements that have come on the market in the last couple of years. Now that there's, there's actually a um, push mulch layer, um, I think it's better if you have people on both sides, but um, it is available. Clear mulch, you can get much higher soil temperatures than that. And um, that is the industry standard for some crops. Um, this one is artichokes, although we don't grow a lot of artichokes here in Ohio. I think this is a photo out of California. Um, but you get much higher soil temperatures in um, using clear plastic mulch. Again, in Ohio, the uh, sweet corn, that's the industry standard for that. It doesn't suppress weed growth. It's a little bit of a problem. Um, so you can't expect to, if you at some point are cutting that clear mulch or removing it, if you haven't used some sort of herbicide that you're going to have um, some weed, weeds there to take care of. The idea is that the plants get big enough that they are not as nearly as affected by weeds. Red mulch, um, again, this is another type that's on the market um, and it is much more expensive. It does, there are some research studies that show that you will have higher tomato production if early blight pressure is high. Um, so if that's an issue in your particular area, maybe red mulch is the way for you. But again, it is does come at a much higher cost. And one thing I will say about the plastic mulches, um, they are not at this point in time biodegradable. So they do have um, some disposal issues at the end of the year or, or whenever you decide to remove them. Um, there ha have been over time companies that will take mulch, but I don't know the status of those situations right now. There are organic mulches available, uh, particularly um, the, the Biotello biodegradable type mulches, but there's a lot more that are on the coming on the market. Um, they're made from starches from different types of commodities. And they do tend to be more traditional than our, our black plastic mulch. Now, one of the challenges that I've run into with some of these biodegradable mulches, and again, I, I don't have access to every new product that's on the market, but they can be um, really, really thin. I mean, you're like, you look at it funny and it rips. So what I had, done at some point is double it, just turn it, you know, fold it over and just use it that way rather than singly. Another challenge that I've seen um, with biodegradable mulch is sometimes it doesn't degrade very fast. So by the end of the season, it's usually pretty torn up, but it's not necessarily degraded. So again, that might be a, a point as a challenge for you, um, but it's just something to be aware of. And again, if you are using any type of mulch always, and you're a certified organic grower, make sure you are talking to your certifier so that you're using something that is gonna fit into your certification program. Paper mulch is um, another new thing that's been on the market recently. Um, it will raise the temperature slightly, but not necessarily 
as high as say the Black Plastic Mulch. It is biodegradable um, and is not stretchy and will fray very quickly. One thing that I do appreciate about paper mulch is that it will give you a jump on weeds. So um, it, it may be, that jump may be long enough to the point where whatever you're growing is big enough that it, it's not in as much competition with the weeds that you, it, it comes at a time where, or that ripping comes at a time where you have a little bit more time to manage it. But what it does is just kind of keeps it down early in the season um, in order to give you a little bit of peace of mind on weed management and a little bit of time to get ahead of the game. Now, of course, there's a lot of different things um, available for mulch. Um, not all of them will raise the soil temperature, but they also do assist in the situation of um, keeping down weeds, which is always helpful in my book for sure. The cold frames are something that have been used for millennia, I'm sure, but basically they're a miniature greenhouse, a passively heated mini greenhouse in, in many ways. And it's usually a wooden frame of some sort, but it can be made of plastic or hay bales or whatever material you have and uh, generally soft facing when possible. So what you'll find is this frame built, um, the front of it will be much lower than the back wall, giving a angled top that is usually made of glass or um, some sort of plastic or poly, uh, polycarbonate. And with, and then it's usually on the soil, just placed right on the soil. And many times it could be um, part of the soil is dug up. So the, so the cold frame is actually placed a little further deep in to the soil. And what happens is um, in that box, if you will, you get this effect of a greenhouse where you, it heats up. And um, one of the challenges you can have with cold frames is they can overheat. Um, another challenge you can have is you can get really high humidity, which can lead to um, disease pressure and things of that nature. But from a small scale grower standpoint, you can build all sorts of cold frames, all sorts of sizes of cold frames, all sorts of um, designs of cold frames that can actually be exactly what you need for your particular scale of operation. Again, as you get bigger, you're going to maybe think things through a little differently, but um, this is, might be something small to start with just to get your feet wet. So sometimes it can be more like a, a low tunnel. Um, there's a little bit more labor cost involved than a low tunnel, and it can be used for hardening off your plants. So this one here that you show in the picture is actually um, my made up cold frame. It's the, um, what do you call this thing? In, in front of your house that holds up the canopy. Um, so we take it down in the winter and I put it up against my garage and that's where I use to um, start a lot of my seedlings and also where I use to harden off my plants. And I can fit about 10, 15 trays that hold 216 plugs each. So I can get a whole heap of plants underneath that. And all that is, again, is the metal frame that I have around the house anyways, um, along with a piece of plastic. Now I do have to manage it. I do have to put the, take the plastic on, I have to take it off. Um, days that I know it's going to be four degrees, I have to bring all those plants in my house. But again, that's a very low commitment sort of um, piece of equipment. Here's another one, I'm sorry, I sh that's a, such an odd angle, um, but this is at an urban farm in Flint, Michigan. Um, and again, a simple wooden frame with a polycarbonate top. Um, they do not have any sort of technology utilizing this cold frame. So they have to manually open it, prop it open and close it at the end of the night. And here's the starts of some of um, the lettuce seeds that they had started. Um, the I started these, I think like, boy, maybe um, mid-March and the photo that I showed was the very first part of April. So, and again, this is a, um, a temperature zone that's a little north of us. So it's gonna take a little bit longer, but um, 
over the course of the season, what they're trying to do is have a succession planting. So these plantings um, were on the same farm and these were from January or something somewhere around that time. Um, so you can see they had several different cold frames that were planted at different times and they had, so they had successive harvest availability for our product and for their market. So this is another um, urban farm that is that was in Salt Lake City, uh, boy, some, some years ago. And this was probably one of the more fancy types of cold frames that you'll find. And this is more of what I consider a hotbed um, because they did have an additional heating. They had heating cables that were running along the bottom are actually underneath the soil in the cold frame. And they had a thermostat that would control opening and closing of that, uh, that cold frame. And those cold frames were running all along the sides of their um, greenhouse. So they were able to grow um, regularly harvested crops for a weekly farmer's market of a couple hundred pounds of lettuce just using these cold frames that were outside that were basically unused space before they installed them. And of course, clutches. So these um, are these have been used again for centuries. So basically it's just some sort of structure that's put over a baby plant to keep it cold, warm during a time that you may have some inclement weather. And, and you could actually be using something like this right now. So, so for example, that raised bed, if you were to plant spinach, arugula, kale, um, spinach, and you covered that with say just a, a clear plastic, you would get good germination and decent production um, as long as our weather didn't do anything weird over the next couple months. The problem with um, the types of bottles that they have up there, um, usually when the weather starts getting a little bit variable, you really need to remove those and put them back on often um, because you will get a very quick heat buildup in those and you can actually scorch your plants. A floating row covers, um, the picture on the left hand side is um, a high tunnel grower that we visited a couple years ago. And this is, this is a secondary season extension. So the high tunnel is the primary, the row cover is a secondary. But in a small scale situation, you can utilize floating row covers, which are uh, spun bound uh, polyester or polypropylene product. It's not a cloth, but it's it's some material, shall we say. And it can be used in a couple different ways. Um, we call them floating row covers because you can just lay them over crops um, without any sort of uh, hoop structure. But you do run the damage if you do that, if you have really, really wet weather and then a freeze of the of the row cover actually freezing to the crop. So you don't want that. Um, the advantage to these, they're permeable to air, light, and water. And I will say though, I've had times where I've used these in a greenhouse and water did not penetrate the floating row cover. So that may not be, um, that might not be the right place. But these are often used um, in, they're, Oops, I'm sorry. They're often used um, with a plastic mulch. So the plastic mulch is on the, on the soil. So that's raising the temperature, say five degrees. Then you put the floating row cover over it. That may raise the temperature another three or four degrees, two degrees, depending on the weight of the row cover because the row cover can actually come in different weights. The heavier the weight, the more, um, the more protection you'll get, the lower the weight, the less protection you'll get. And often the, the lowest weights are really used for insect exclu exclusion. But as I had mentioned with the, that raising of that temperature, you're actually gaining sometimes half a zone, sometimes a full zone of protection. And again, by manipulating the, the microclimate of the crop that's, that's between the soil and the top of the floating row cover, um, but again, you have to spend some time putting it on, taking it off, 
depending on what your weather, weather is. As I had mentioned, um, they do come in different weights. Um, so you'll want to take a very, very um, close look at that. They also come in, the, the product also comes in varying widths, anywhere from three feet wide to 60 feet wide. So 60 feet is one of those that you're going to utilize in a, say, a high tunnel that you're pulling over an entire crop. Um, when you're thinking about what width you get, what you want to remember with the floating row covers or any type of lower row covers, I'll talk about this in a minute, is how are you going to weigh that down? So sometimes you'll see products like these spikes and sometimes you'll see different sorts of things, but these things will fly off very, very easily. So what you want is if you're putting it over the entire road, there's a lot of not a lot, but at least some material on both sides that you're able to place something on there that's going to hold it down. I will tell you, brick cement blocks will rip that material very quickly. And um, util usually you're looking at things like um, sandbags or um, these bags, the names escape me now that you put like broken rocks and stuff like in garbon bags or something like that, um, those can also be used pretty successfully. The lengths of the row, of the row cover can vary anyway from uh, 20 to uh, 2,500 feet. I actually bought a couple rolls of 2,500 feet for some grant projects I was working on last summer, and they're huge, and they're hard for me to manage. So um, I had to get a lot of help to get the get those cut down to the lengths that I actually needed. So if you're going to get something large like that, understand that it's going to take a little bit of labor just to just to get the stuff unpacked in the first place. I feel like there's something else I wanted to say about floating row cover. I'll remember. Um, as I had mentioned, generally the lighter weight is used for insect protection. So during the summer, uh, smaller scale growers may use that, and even medium scale growers may use that for say cucumber beetles, uh, flea beetles, things of that nature. The medium weight is usually used for early season protection. And then the, the heavier weight is usually used for frost protection or winter protection for high tunnels. So the picture on the left-hand side, that is actually where, um, the grower keeps it kind of folded up to the side. And whenever they need it, they just, one goes on one side, one goes on the other side, and then they work together to pull it over the entire length of the, of the high tunnel. So edges are big, big challenges. So if you have equipment, if you have, um, tractors and implements where you can bury those um, floating row covers, that is very, very helpful. If not, um, you need, as I had mentioned, you need to find something that's going to weigh them down. One of the challenges with the, the cover itself is that it can be easily damaged by weather or animals. Um, so if, if it blows off and it gets caught up in trees or whatever, you're trying to pull it out, gets ripped on branches, or sometimes just that Flapping is, is enough to tear it, um, or when you have animals that are, get stuck in it and are startled and are trying to get out of it, um, they can rip that. I've had that happen with deer and dogs, and I've had cats tear it up. So um, it's not a product that's meant to live forever. It's nice that you could get a one or two seasons out of it. I'm sure there's folks that have had better luck than I have and had it last longer, but um, that's generally what I'm trying to do is get at least two seasons out of the material. If you're using it as an insect um, barrier, then you, if you have a crop that um, needs an insect pollinator, you will have to remove it. So there's a lot of research being done on this on like at what crop stage um, you should take the cover off. You know, we think, okay, if as soon as, as, soon as it starts to flower, well, not necessarily. Sometimes um, research indicates my a little bit later is you're going to get the most production, but you may lose that 
initial first flush of production. So that's a for another for another day. So load tunnels are kind of along the same lines as offloading row cover. So usually <laughs> load tunnels are going to be um, something that's a plastic type material that you're putting over um, some sort of structure. That structure might be uh, some heavy gauge metal wire. It might be electrical conduit. It might be um, PVC piping. Um, but most of the times they're not permeable to air or water unless you get a, the special types of plastic that will have either slits or, or holes punched into it. And labor uh, be pretty intensive for these types of systems. So the one you see on the right hand side is actually, um, this was at ORDC uh, in Worcester, quite maybe three or four, maybe even longer ago than that. Um, but these are raised beds. Um, there is, uh, I believe that's a six gauge wire, maybe, um, that's over those raised beds. And they're held on by metal clamps. And that's another one of the challenges is the type of clamping that you use to keep the cover on. Um, they've, there's been better designs since this product first came out. So sometimes you'll see clips, sometimes you'll see um, other things, but these clamps seem to work really well, but they're expensive. So think about all those clamps that you have to have if you have a, a long amount of um, bed length. So this particular type of plastic, when it heats up uh, or when the temperature gets high enough underneath of it, it actually, um, has slits in the side of it, and the plastic itself will turn slightly to open those slits. So ventilation makes its way into um, the inside of that low tunnel, which is very important because two things. One, if your crap heats up, you can actually crisp it. I mean, kill it just outright. Or you can get, um, you can create conditions that are conducive to disease development and um, that air movement helps decrease uh, the likelihood of disease development. So this system is actually set up for a two tunnel system. So that smaller tunnel um, that you see there and the um, conduit piping has been bent that's above that. And there actually will be another cover put over that. Again, the first layer of plastic, you're getting about five degrees. The second layer, you're getting a couple more degrees. So again, changing that microenvironment to raise the temperature. So you're basically tricking the plant into thinking it's someplace warmer like South Carolina instead of um, Trumbull County in the middle of um, November or March. Here's another type of uh, low tunnel plastic. So this is the punched hole type. So basically you do uh, get a lot more air movement in, in these types and you can get some rainwater that falls in there. You don't get much, I will tell you that. It's like trying to throw a, you know, a ping pong ball into a cup or something. It just happens to be if the drop falls right there. Um, it, and you do get much more heat buildup in, in this type of plastic. Um, but these are good for the type of warm season crops that grow upright. So peppers, eggplant, and um, summer squash, things like that. So this is what they may look like in the winter months. And again, um, if you're just using a plastic sheet that doesn't have any sort of um, ear um, infiltration or water infiltration, a couple of things can happen. One, on warm days, you can get quick heat and humidity buildup. Um, and I was thinking that there's something else I had to mention, but I think I'm forgetting it right now, but I'll remember it here in a, just a minute. But, uh, oh, so when you have this heat buildup, if you have crops that are, are triggered by quick heat buildup, such as like collard greens or lettuce, what you can actually have happen is bolting, which, um, you're, you know, because the, the plant is confused about what's going on and it thinks it's going to die. So it, it goes into a bolting mold 
really quickly. So that's one of the challenges with these um, lower tunnel or two tunnel systems is that they're not as easily during the winter um, manipulated in the way that say a high tunnel would be just because the high tunnel is bigger and taller. Some of the support you can use for low tunnels, um, like I had uh, mentioned, you can the metal wire, um, electrical conduit that you can bend or PVC pipe. And there's a lot of um, farm companies that will sell um, hoop benders. And it does not, it's not hard. If I can do it, anybody can do it. So, um, and you can build your own hoop bender. So you, I mean, there's a lot of uh, plans online that you can utilize, but there's also places you can purchase them too. So here's um, another uh, example from a small urban farm. Um, I like this example because it's uh, on, on stilts or on legs. So there's not a whole heap of um, uh, physical bending and things of that nature that sometimes can be problematic. And so this particular set of beds were covered with a uh, plastic that was not, did not have any um, slits or cuts or holes. It was um, built out of PVC piping, held on with clamps um, and easily uh, moved and opened. These are some that were not on um, legs, but you can see there are longer beds, they're much heavier. Um, but they're also using uh, PVC piping that was attached on the sides. Plastic was easily put over the top. They could get really, really quick um, early season radish and greens production out of these beds, which was the um, you know, advantage to having these. Whereas if they were just growing these in open field production, it could probably be you know, depending on the weather, first, first, last part of May, first part of June, but utilizing these beds that could get production April, or beginning of April, um, moving into May. And then they're able to turn them over into utilizing a summer crop or cool season crop much faster. And this is very simple construction. They're just held together by zip ties and on the side of the beds, um, they're just clamped on, but they were easily removed if they needed, when and if they needed to be removed. And I want to talk a, a lot about high tunnels because as a um, vegetable producer and even a fruit producer, high tunnels have become very um, important in this um, in this this type of work. The basics are they're passively heated, meaning that there isn't any sort of external heat source added. Now this being said, um, there are uh, examples where there is heat introduced into high tunnels. Um, there are a lot of growers, particularly those in the southern part of Ohio who are able to put their high tunnel, put their tomatoes in in like February, which I can't even begin to imagine. But they're utilizing some uh, supplemental heat that can, um, this insurance against when they're going to have really um, inclement weather. Generally, you're going to have drip irrigation with a high tunnel. You want drip irrigation because you're not getting any sort of rainfall. So that water has to be added to those plants somehow. So when you're thinking about what you're looking for in a high tunnel, drip irrigation is going to be one of those investments that you should consider in your, in your budget. Prices can range for high tunnels anywhere from, I think, and I think it's been a couple of years since I updated this figure now that I'm looking at it. Um, it can range in, in square feet. So you get what you pay for. You can build your own high tunnel. You can purchase a kit that has everything. You can have somebody install it and you can have all sorts of bells and whistles. It really just depends on what's right for you. Now, in some parts of Ohio, there are some um, set aside special programs for um, getting high tunnel contracts. So the Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, which many of you may be aware of already, um, you can apply for 
to be to receive one of these contracts. Um, and I'm I'm not sure across the state, you know, what that means. Generally, you're in competition. It's a point basis. And um, so there's lots of considerations. And if you are thinking about a high tunnel, there are a lot of things that you have to take into consideration. First of all, it's a huge commitment. Um, our colleague, uh, Brad Burgerford, this is the way he described um, high tunnel production to me. And this is, I clearly remember this in my first week of work in September of 2011. High tunnels are like this. You get up in the morning, you check the high tunnel. You eat breakfast, you go check the high tone. Before you go to work, you check the high tone. On your way home for lunch, you check the high tone, or you may drive past it at least once or twice. When you get home, you check it, you have your dinner, maybe you drink a beer, you check the high tone. And then you have one ear awake all night waiting for plastic to start flapping. Because if you think about it, it's a completely contained environment. So plants aren't meant to live in this without some help. So on days that it's really cold, the sides need to be shut. On the days that it's really warm, the sides need to be open. You might have to put a frost blanket on. You might not need to take it off. You might have to um, open the vent. You might have to um, open the, the, the doors because there just isn't enough air moving in. So this type of structure is a commitment. In addition to being a financial commitment and a time commitment, it's also a commitment to learning a completely different production system than you might be used to. So, um, you know, if you, th if you think everything, if you're growing outside, there's, there's certain things you know. The, you know that uh, your plants may at certain times have enough water and uh, you don't have to go water because you just got an time, so you're good. You're not gonna have that in a high tunnel situation. You're gonna have to ensure that you're adding that adequately. Um, think about insect control. Outside in, in the open environment, um, there are certain ways that you would, would manage insect and, and you know that um, if you do X, Y, and Z, that you have a good chance of managing those. But again, a high tunnel situation, you have a different sort of environment. So you may have, um, you may be creating an environment that your plants are more likely to develop certain diseases. You may have, you might be creating an environment with their, um, where insects may, may um, mature faster. We were talking to a green high, or high tunnel grower in Lorain County last week, and they were doing some scouting. And if you wouldn't believe it, they actually had active spider mites um, middle of March. And that was, you know, we had a couple of warm days, but that's that's what you face when you when you are dealing with high tunnel production. So there's lots of different pieces to the high tunnel that you uh, may have to think about when you're when you're deciding what you want. Um, so one of the things that you're really thinking about is making sure that um, you have the types of structure that you want as far as the doors and as far as the sidewalls in them um, and your ability to roll them up and roll them down. But what I have noticed is, um, you know, some years ago they were the kind of the new thing on the block. And what I'm seeing are just more and more um, growers either um, purchasing high tunnels or engaging in season extension in one way or another. What you have to think about is, does the crop justify the cost? So inside of these structures is really, really um, high value real estate. So whatever you're growing, you wanna make sure it's something that you are going to um, be able to sell for to make back your costs on it. Now, as I had mentioned, at some times you can, um, you can get contracts, uh, cost share contracts with NRCS that'll help you cover those costs. But indeed, if you have the, the 
access to this type of technology, even though it's not a, a high technology, you want to make sure that the time you're putting into it is going to be is going to be money you're going to get back uh, based on the sales of your costs. So think about it. If you if you want to grow spinach off season and you have you know X amount of spinach ready in April 1st, if you don't have a market for it, you're going to be eating a lot of spinach. So a lot of things have to kind of move together and you as a farmer, you'll be growing your market base at the same time you're growing your crop or, or thinking about developing those at the same time to make sure that whatever you're putting into it, you're gonna be able to get out. You wanna think about efficient use of space for profitability. So, and again, that's gonna depend on you. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about the, de the design. So this one here on the right-hand side, this is a um, in-ground production, which most of us are familiar with. Uh, being in an urban center, I see a lot of raised bed production. I will tell you, um, if you do get an NRCS contract, they have strict height limits on the raised beds. So I think they can't be more than 12 inches or something like that. But you want to you want to pay attention to that. Um, this is a pretty efficient use of space. It looks like almost every darn inch of that on the on the right hand side is being used, except for this couple little walkways. Which man, there's no way I would be able to walk through that without hurting myself. But um, other folks have different ideas of how to best use their space, and also to protect their their um, physical. Um, being. So a lot of folks do use raised beds in high tunnels, um, and there's a lot of advantage to high, to, to raised beds. One, you still get even more soil warm up. Um, ergonomically, they're easier to, to work with because you just don't have to bend, bend down as much and, and, and move around as much. But you do lose a little bit of space. And you also want to think about when you have to utilize those that secondary row cover on the winter, how easy is it for you or whoever your staff is to put those covers on quickly? Um, so uh, Lee and I were, were talking about having kids a little bit earlier and one of my grower friends was, um, it was always a stress for him in the winter because his kids were young. So he and his wife, every time they had to put the row cover, the, the big row cover, the blanket on their crops in the winter, they'd have to get the kids dressed, haul them out to the high tunnel, hope that they didn't like hurt themselves and keep a really close eye on them because he couldn't get the, get it on by himself. Um, and it was a happy day when it got to the point where they could, um, well, two things. One, they could leave the kids in the house for 10 minutes by themselves, or um, he developed a way that he could get the entire uh, blanket on the entire length of it. So you need to think about what's efficient for you for space and for profitability, and also for your equipment. If the equipment that you're purchasing or have purchased, um, how that's going to fit into whatever um, whatever type of design that you're using, this strong, long, straight rows, that lends itself to one side type of tool, whereas shorter raised beds, that may necessitate a different type of tool. Um, orientation, generally this is the recommended orientation. If it's north of the uh, 40th latitude, ridge should run north to south. If south of uh, 40th latitude, ridge should run west to east and perpendicular to prevailing winds. And again, um, Sometimes you put it up the where you can put it up. So it, you, you have to do what you have to do and do the best you can and live with, live with what you have, uh, depending on your particular site. One thing I should say about high tunnels, if you are considering putting one up, you need to find out in your, um, your, your jurisdiction, your township or your city, what the rules are for putting them up. Um, where I live, uh, there aren't rules about putting them up. So I have a temporary one that we sometimes put up in our backyard um, until, until we're told to take it down. Um, but the city of Cleveland, there's a very specific, very well organized permit policy that you have to follow. Some cities will make you um, 
really go through a lot of hoops. They'll make you get architectural drawings and all sorts of things. But what I would not recommend is putting them up, putting the structure up without having the right um, type of um, documentation in place because they can make you take them down if, um, if, if there's complaints made. And I have seen that happen a couple of times. If you're thinking about a high tunnel, what I really encourage you to do is to think about your site prep. And this is a challenge that I see a lot. Um, again, because a lot of it's because I'm working in an urban center. What you wanna do is get your site ready in such a way that you're not gonna be paying for it later. So you wanna get your weeds under control. So particularly if you have perennial weeds, it will be, I wouldn't say impossible, but very, very difficult to get those controlled after you put the structure up um, and killing off turf. I, I can't tell you the many times I've seen this where folks will put it up, but they haven't prepared the site in any way. There's, you know, grass, it's, you know, two feet tall and can of thistles as tall as Christmas trees. And then, you know, the question is, oh, how do I, how to get this under control? I'm like, oh. Put up a for sale sign i'm not sure i mean you can but it makes it a heck of a lot easier if you do it ahead of time so weed control ph adjustment if that's what you need if you need soil amendments if you need to level the ground up and also think about how close you are to other structures because again those other structures can cause shading for you that would also potentially affect your um your yields other considerations that you should think about, um, and again, these are kind of, they're details that you don't think about until it's too late. So sidewalls, um, so there are the types of sidewalls. Um, those are the ones, those are the, the things on the side that roll up or roll down to um, let heat out, to let air in, and that's how you're regulating the temperature in the tunnel. So the thing with the side walls is that it's usually done by some sort of crank. So if you've ever sailed and you've, you, you pull on the sail with a winch, it's kind of a similar, similar type of tool. But the challenge is you need to think about what you can manage. So you can, if, if for whatever reason you accidentally let go, handles, and that's why I put handles next, you can hurt, really hurt yourself by accidentally letting it go. It can pull your arm, it can break your arm or your wrist or things of that nature. So you want to think carefully when you're making those decisions and ones that are going to be the safest for you. Doors, um, you want your doors, well, there's two types of doors. There's the larger doors that you can um, roll up or, or roll up um, to get larger implements like tractors in. So you can have those or you can decide not to have those. You can, um, and there's many different ways that those doors attach. So one of the weirdest stories I have about urban agriculture and high tunnels is um, I asked some of the folks that I, when I first started in Ohio, if they'd had any issues. And, they have had the zippers on their doors stolen a number of times, which is, the, in my opinion, one of the weirdest things, but you know, who knows? Um, you wanna make sure if you don't have those larger doors that your side doors are big enough to get any sort of equipment through that you have to. So um, I inherited a tunnel through my last job that I had to maintain and um, the tunnel had never been used. So the first time I went over there with, with the BCS, I look at the, the door and I look at the BCS. I'm like, there is no way I can get this BCS through that door. And I did, but boy, I'm telling you, it had to this and move this and move this and pull it up and pull it down. And I'm, you can't see me, but I'm short and it was challenging. And if we had somehow, even though doors come in standard sizes, made that just a little bit bigger, it would have made our life a lot easier. You want to think about vents. So there are, there are type of vents that automatically open based on um, the temperature and, and it's, uh, there's oil and 
and the temperature raises up, the pin heats it, something, I don't know, but it, it opens. So therefore you're not manually have to open. There's ones that are, are battery operated, they can open that way, but you wanna have vents. You also wanna think about your beds. Again, I had talked about that, what your design is gonna be. So this particular operation here, they had access to 75 million bricks. So they decided they were gonna utilize bricks for their raised beds. Um, which worked fairly okay. After a couple of years, I started having some issues with moss and, and just deterioration. But another advantage to this was the bricks were actually a little bit of a heat sink. So they kept, um, it kept it warmer, just a little bit warmer than normal high tunnels would be that did not have this sort of brick. And one thing I want to note about high tunnels when I'm talking about temperatures is sometimes folks think, well, it always stays so much warmer inside the tunnel than outside the tunnel. And that's not necessarily true. The tunnel, the internal temperature of the tunnel can and mostly does get as cool as the outside temperature does at, at night. But it will take much longer for um, the, the, temp the internal temperature of the tunnel to cool down than it does outside. And it will stay at that temperature much for a much shorter period of time. So the, the tunnel will get as cold, but it doesn't have that duration of cold. There's other things that you have to think about. Um, one, soil management. If you're continually putting pressure um, by growing, 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 and not having natural rainfall. So what we're actually seeing in some high tunnel systems is uh, soil management issues with salt buildup in the soil. Um, so as you're thinking about purchasing one or utilizing one, have a long-term management plan in place, which also leads into your plant rotation. So generally in high tunnels, which what we're seeing or we have seen in some cases is tomato after tomato after tomato after tomato after tomato. So what do we know about tomatoes? They have every pest, disease, sickness, illness, ickiness known to man. So as you get that buildup of a plant material, pest issues, over time, you're really gonna cause yourself some problems if you're not rotating your plant families. Um, some people do that by um, having several tunnels. Some people work on that plant rotation by having movable tunnels. And I'll, I'll give an example of that here in just a moment. Meaning one, one part of the year, you'll have the tunnel over a certain crop. You're able to then move that tunnel with a tractor or something that can drag something um, over another crop. So you're able to do a little bit more rotation there. And you also want to think about your fertilization because again, you're not getting that natural rainfall that you usually would have through the soil profile. So you can have some um, salt issues over time. You also want to think about maintenance concerns because it's plastic. So it, it's gonna break down. Um, so plastic does need to replace eventually. Um, how often that is happens is really dependent on a number of factors. I've seen plastic last for about three weeks and I've seen it last for about eight years, but you do get over time less light transparency um, with plastic. And it depends on how much damage uh, that plastic um, is exposed to over time and, and damage can happen from all sorts of things. Uh, one person I was working with in Cleveland, I went into the, her tunnel. She was so excited to show it to me. It was her second tunnel. And um, I'm looking, for whatever reason, I looked up and I looked up at the, the top and I'm like, why is there are all those pencils in the ceiling? Where'd those pencils come from? I didn't have my glasses on, but what I realized is they were, um, uh, Northern Catulpa pods that had uh, blown into her, her area from a storm from a neighbor's house and pierced the top of the plastic. I mean, and it had never even been used. You can have birds that'll peck at the plastic. You'll have, you can have 
you can't imagine the types of things that can happen that will, will cause rips. And of course there's ways to fix that, but eventually um, you may have to replace it and that can be a little bit costly. Side rollers, um, again, you can have, the, those can just need replacement or over time, or sometimes the, the material that that's on the, the roller bar is a string and sometimes that will that'll break. Snow load can be an issue, um, even though designs have gotten much better. The high tunnel outside my office, um, the couple weeks ago when we had that heavy, heavy wet snow, I'm not sure why this happened, but the, um, not the baseboard, but the rib or not, I can't think of the part right now, but it's the one that's like three feet up off the, off the ground for whatever reason, it completely almost collapsed. And it was, a, it's a well, it's a well-built tunnel. It is well taken care of. Um, but for whatever reason, that particular type of snow and the wind or, or whatever happened caused that to, to really bend up. And if you're in, a, in an area that has a lot of folks, you can experience vandalism of all sorts of nature. Sometimes that means just people coming into the tunnel, just seeing what the heck's going on because they just want to see what's going on. Sometimes it can be other sorts of uh, mischievous behavior, um, but it is something to, to keep in mind that could happen. Now, when I talk about uh, season extension, one of the persons that you probably would have heard of is Elliot Coleman. Um, he's considered the father of successful season extension. And I would say he's definitely one of the first persons to put out really good comprehensive literature on, on how he was doing it. Um, pretty famous market gardener, Maine, but he doesn't have a huge site. I think it's only about two acres. But I have had so many people at their very, very wit's end not being able to, to produce in the same way that Elliot does. But one thing to note, he is based in Maine and you just get a heck of a lot more sunshine than you do there, than you do in Northeast Ohio. Now this book here on the on left-hand side is one of his first editions. He has a newer edition that was put out in 2009. Since that point in time, there's been a tremendous amount more um, resources put on both lines and in the written form and the book form that you can easily access. But um, it's a fun, good read. And what he uses are the movable tunnels. So um, what's nice about those is that, again, you're avoiding some of the soil management issues and some of the disease buildup pressures. One of the disadvantages to those types of tunnels are is that if you get the right type of weather, they will move. Like, I've seen pictures of ones that like blew across the highway. Um, some of my experiences here in Ohio that they haven't blown quite that far, but they've come off, the, they're on a track and they've come off the track and moved like five feet to the west on an angle. So <laughs> they were still able to use it, but it wasn't exactly um, straight and it caused some other issues. So some other resources here in Ohio, a vegetable production systems library, um, laboratory, which is Matt Kleinhentz's um, research program. He has a tremendous amount of resources online. In addition, he just did um, along with a lot of um, extension uh, participants, um, a several, uh, five or six webinars on different topics relating to high tunnel production, uh, uh, pest and disease scouting, soil management, soil health. So I definitely check those out if this is something that you're interested in. In addition, he has a lot of information about um, grafted vegetables, which are becoming more commonplace in our um, high-end production systems. Here are a few more that you might wanna consider. So ATRA, um, University of Kentucky, uh, ASEER, a lot of different, a uh, lot of excellent resources. And I will say um, University of Iowa, or Iowa State University has recently put out some really, really good high tunnel production information that um, is easily adaptable many places. So this isn't an endorsement for Johnny Seeds, but what I will say is they have some excellent resources on their um, website, including this planting calculator. 
Um, and so they have several different planting calculators. You always wanna look at the notes. So the dates that are on uh, the calculator, these are for in um, open air production. If you're planting inside a hoop house, so additional layer of hoops, row cover, you can plant four to five weeks later than the date recommended. If doing it earlier, you can do it a little, you know, so make sure you're paying attention to those notes, but there's some great calculators um, on that site that could be very helpful to you. Um, not only for high tunnels, but also if you're also using um, low tunnels or floating row covers. If you're thinking about season extension, um, there are long-term commitments. Um, you wanna make sure that you are putting the time into the soil preparation, because if you don't, it will hurt you on the long run. And I can say in my um, production systems is, if I could do anything over, I would have spent an extra year on my site just in soil preparation and weed management. And um, there's lots of variations on this particular saying, but prior planning prevents poor production. So the more you plan um, and the, the better soil health um, situation that you have, um, the just the better production you're gonna get. When I'm talking about site prep for soil test, um, remove any weeds and grass that you might have, control your perennial weeds. And before you put up any permanent structure, um, you can do cover crop rotations and make sure you're adding amendments or adjusting the pH as it recommended to do so. When you're thinking about what crops you're gonna grow, again, you wanna think about what those high value crops are and what you're gonna get the most, um, most profits from. And I will say this is not something that, this is something I personally struggle with, is um, trying to figure out where you know, actual costs. As farmers, sometimes we, we um, don't value our labor as much as we should. Sometimes we forget to add inputs that are, or calculate in inputs that we need that will lower our profits. So make sure that you're thinking about what your budgets are gonna be for next year. And again, you also wanna think about for every plate that, seed that you're planting, where are you gonna sell what that produce is? Places where you're going to need a lot of labor and season extension regarding what you're, regardless of what you are doing, and this is going to be for season extension or any side of any sort of production, your bread preparation, maintaining um, your your structure and your crops, planting, pest control, and harvest. And I should maintenance. I should put weeding, 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 because if you don't have any, if you're not using any mulch and things like that, it may take you a little bit of time to figure out what your weed management strategy is. Ownership costs for a seasonal high tunnel. Um, generally, um, the, the lifespan is about eight years. That being said, I've seen ones, the first ones that were put up 20 years still standing. It's more of there's things that have broken down that have had to be fixed. And usually what you can um, depend on if you don't have any strange sorts of damage to plastic about four years, every four years you should, you should consider replacing it. Again, make sure that you have your markets. Um, if you're utilizing high tunnel or low tunnels, you should be able to get produce about a month sooner and about one to two months later during the gr regular growing season. But again, some of this is going to depend on um, your weather, cloud cover, and temperature, and as I sometimes say, your um, temperature inputs, whether you have heating cables or whether you're burning sterno to you know, keep the temperature up at a certain point. So what's your profit potential? And again, this can vary from $0 to more than $3. Um, conservatively, um, we'll say about $3 for, for high value crops. Um, and again, it, it really depends. There are some places where $1 would probably be um, profit potential. Again, it just depends on, on where you're selling um, and again, how much you are, what your skills are. And those will grow over time. Um, you know, in your first years, you might aim for this amount of pounds of tomatoes per tomato plant. But, you know, after three, four, five years, that yield 
should be increasing as you get better at what you're doing. So at this point, I'll be happy to answer any questions folks might have. Thanks, Jacqueline. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat box, or if you're comfortable enough, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, but as those are coming in, I do have one question, Jacqueline. If you have not dabbled in season extension before, what would be the easiest and most practical way to get started? So the, the first thing I would do, if you're gonna, if you wanna start right now, is build yourself a cold frame and use that. That's, that's very easy. And you can use that year after year. I might also consider putting aside a small part, if you've never done it before, putting a small part aside, you know, purchasing some Remare Agrabon, which is that polyspun material, trying a different couple different types of hoops, because you should be able to do some, some soil soil preparation, and then plant a few things using those, using those hoops, you know, and again, experiment with a couple different types to see what works best for you. Those are low, um, low commitment inputs. They, you can usually, if, at least with the, with the um, cold frames, you can usually use like found material or recycle material, things that you can get for free. Um, the Using the low tunnels is gonna be a little bit of a cost, but you don't have to buy like 7,000 hoops. You can make four and put it over one raised bed, try it, see how it works. And as you get better, or if it, you say, this is just not for me, or, or you run into some challenges, you try and troubleshoot, maybe try different things next month. Um, just to, just to see how it goes. Thanks, Jacqueline. I'll give it a second. Um, anybody have questions before I jump into my next question? Again, feel free to use the chat box. Cassandra said, no, that sounds awful, but I don't know what that was. Oh, I think she's referring to the Catalpa pods shooting. Oh, through the gosh. Side of the... It was awful. Yeah, I couldn't imagine having to um, to kind of just be having an opening and then have that happen. I know um, I've had some calamities with high tunnels in the past. Um, the biggest challenge being replacing that plastic when it goes. Um, mm -hmm. So, but to have that happen that fast, oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, I, I felt terrible. Fortunately, there were small holes. So like a, some tape on each side was, it was easily patched, but there was about 700 patches that he put on. That was horrible. So Jacqueline, um, I do have a question. So if we start our, the season extension practices in March, and we're looking to start selling in a farmer's market, but a lot of our farmer's markets do not open until mm -hmm. June. Outside of doing some direct marketing to either consumers through social media or reaching out to restaurants, do you have any advice? I know that's not the topic of this presentation, but do you have any advice on how to get rid of that produce other than eating a bunch of spinach? So, and I mean, and that, that is a big deal. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you a personal, personal situation. So I grow a lot of peonies. I have about 200 peony bushes and they're not fully grown, but this is like their fourth year. So when do peonies usually start to flower in Northeast Ohio? Um, about the week after Mother's Day. So I miss that entire market. And most of the, the farmer's markets that I, um, that I consign to don't open till the second week in June. So I have this huge amount of product that I have invested in and have to move. So in that case, um, and if you're in that case with your high tunnel, first of all, plan that you're not gonna have, unless you have a market, that you, you're not gonna end up with that quantity of produce. You can, um, I think your best bets at this point in time are utilizing social media 
You can also ask if this is um, appropriate in your community to do like a little pop-up that may be in conjunction with, um, usually in, in every town there's, there's a restaurant or a coffee shop that's really, really open to local, local purchasing. They might allow you to do a pop-up. Um, whatever you do, you wanna make sure you're in compliance with what the, what the state rules are, or, or not the state, the, whatever those township rules are. I know that there are some towns where you can go ask a drugstore if you can set up a little stand in their parking lot and they'll let you. My town is not one of those, but that's always an option. Um, so social media, I think is your best bet. Try and find a partner. You can also, at that early in the season, even though it's early, there might be some active CSAs. And so you might wanna call farmers that are running those early season CSAs and say, hey, I have extra spinach or extra radishes or extra whatever. They might have need for it. And that might, that might also lead to a long-term um, relationship that you can, you can sell produce with them as well. Thanks, Jacqueline. Are there other questions? All right. Well, if not, thank you, Jacqueline. This was fantastic. Um, and uh, I, I think hopefully some of us are thinking about season extension. I know my wife probably is. Um, oh, one question just came in. I know we're all thinking about the early and the end of the growing season, but how late do you find the high tunnel extends on that end? Again, it all depends on the weather. Um, so I have seen all the way through January of the next year. Um, but it, again, it depends what you have. There are some crops that just deteriorate pretty quickly in cooler weather. So um, red lettuces, they tend to be some of the first to go. And what happens is when, after you get a certain point in time in the year and a certain amount of daylight, crops don't grow, they just kind of persist. So what you may be doing is just doing light harvests off the plant through till you can't, till it's done. Um, and that, that's going, going to change from year to year. But you know, you're definitely going through, you know, most years, you're definitely going through the holiday, end of the year holidays. And what you can also do is in some cases you can you can seed, you can direct seed those high tunnels so that even though that crop's not growing yet, as soon as the as soon as the um as soon as the temperature, soil temperature is warm enough, those those seeds will start to germinate. So there's lots of work you can do in the high tunnel during the off season. Um, you can also have your carrot crops in there. And as the weather gets cooler, the, the I don't quite know all the physiology behind this, but the carrots will and can um, have a lot of uh, sugars that are converted, so they're a little bit sweeter during the um, during the cooler months of the year. Um, and Amy said, "No questions, just info." I will put in a plug for other gardening webinars uh, programs. Check out Shenango Crest on Facebook. If you know the beginning gardeners, Ashtabula OSU Extension is having a series as well. Um, check out Villa Maria, farm right over the border in Pulaski, PA. And thanks. And Jacqueline, coming from Maine, I will tell you there are a lot of greenhouses. We do get a, no, not used to, a lot more sun than we do in Northeastern Ohio. Um, but I will tell you, it's also cheaper to put a heater in a high <laughs> tunnel than it is to put an air conditioner in one in Northeastern Ohio. So there is an advantage there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. significantly cheaper and that's, that's a very common practice mm -hmm. so. yeah I um spending most of my career in the Virgin Islands it was a shock to me um that uh, we have so much cloud cover in this part of the, the United States because it's much brighter in northern Michigan too so I don't, I don't know it's just a just how it is yeah um, even with that cloud cover, I was out in uh, Mesopotamia at a farm that was getting some starts ready to sell. So pepper plants, you know, sell to the home gardeners. Mm -hmm. 
and it was end of April, and that miniature green, well, I would say it's miniature, it's probably 15 by 40. Um, it was 95 degrees, and the pepper plants were, they were smoked. They were completely dead. Um, so it, it does warm up very, very quick. So when you're talking about having a beer checking on the, the high tunnel, yes, you do have to keep a very close eye on it. Yes, the one in our office was about 90 degrees on one day last week as well. So, and we, some of the uh, mustard in there did get a little crispy. Yeah. I think that was always our challenge too, right? Because sometimes it would get really, really hot during the day, but then go back to freezing at night. And once that sun's gone, some of that is staying locked in there, but it, it stressed the seedlings out every once in a while. Um, particularly early in the season, there was always a lot of praying going mm -hmm. on to <laughs> hope that everything came out okay. Yes, and stress the operators too, I'm sure, trying to keep up with the opening and closing and covering and recovering and such. And, and one thing that I also, if you're thinking about going in the high tunnels, be very careful if you're using any uh, fungicides because any phytotoxicity effects are amplified in a greenhouse stressful condition. Mm -hmm. And if you are if you are going that route, it is important to know that um, a lot of materials that are labeled for outside production aren't necessarily labeled for um, high tunnels and greenhouses specifically. Well, for many reasons, but that's one of the reasons. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Jacqueline. Sure. Um, and we will have your information available. So if there's any questions, we can direct them to you. But with that, I will turn it back over to Cassandra. Thank you all so very much. Um, you'll be getting some reminder emails from me um, for next week. And we'll see you all next Tuesday. Have a great evening, everybody. Good night.